conjecture or hypothesis on my part. That's the fact of history. Let's talk about that temple because this is such a key part of the Jesus story that's omitted in traditional Christianity, his sojourn in time and training in Egypt. So please tell us about this temple. Well, it was set up uh, around about 170 BC. What happened was the Syrians invaded Egypt, which at that time was part of the Egyptian Empire uh, under the Pharaoh at the time was Ptolemy the Seventh. And the high priest in Jerusalem, who was rather like a viceroy, he uh, was the representative, really, of the Pharaoh in uh, Israel. He controlled the financial side of Israel. He controlled the military side of Israel. And, of course, he was the high priest of the temple. And he was of the particular bloodline of those who were destined to serve in the temple. His name was Ananias. And when uh, the armies of Antiochus Epiphanes invaded from Syria uh, there was quite a battle the temple got looted Ananias had to flee into exile with quite a number of his priests the Syrian king set up a new line of priests to operate the temple but they weren't of this pure line the pure line went with Ananias through to Egypt and Ananias was a friend of Ptolemy the Seventh, and so he asked for an old temple, a ruined temple of Bubastus that he had found in the, in the uh, Nile Delta. And Ptolemy gave this to Ananias, and Ananias rebuilt it as a Jewish temple. And it lasted, actually, for the next 150 or more years. It lasted till a later date than the temple in Jerusalem. And the interesting thing to me was that this, in a sense, was the only legitimate Jewish temple because it was the only temple served by priests still of this legitimate line. Now to sort of put this into some kind of historical context for people, it was this invasion by the Syrians that caused the Maccabean revolt. Judas Maccabee was the leader of the faction that utterly opposed this invasion. So when we talk of the Book of Maccabees, for example, we're talking of this political instability which followed the Syrian invasion but already Ananias had gone to the Delta and had founded another temple there. But this temple seems to have been operating a system that was uh, Zadokite, that is, it had a line of priests with the line of Zadok, but it doesn't seem to have been politically involved as were these particular people in Israel. And one of the distinctions I make in the book is that Jesus withdrew from his political involvement. And this, for me, was a major uh, reorientation that I had to do because I'd, al I'd always seen Jesus as very committed to the political process in Israel because mm -hmm. Jesus is surrounded by zealots, but he broke right. with them, and I think that caused a problem. Yeah, and one of the other points I wanted to talk with you about too, Michael, is that we, uh, I interviewed Robert Feather, who wrote a book called The Secret Initiation of Jesus at Qumran, and he talked about that the, the zealots and even the Zadokites themselves had a real problem with the temple high priest, and the Essenes seemed to have had a problem with the temple itself. And that's why I was so uh, just on the edge of my seat when all of a sudden you're telling us about this temple in Egypt that is modeled or built on the same design as the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm wondering, wow, there's a real problem going on in Jerusalem at that time among these groups. There's something yeah. bogus about the Temple of Solomon, and it continues to this day because they've continued to cover up whatever that problem was and don't really seem to want to talk about the existence of a duplicate of this temple in Egypt. So this is a very curious matter. Even scholars, as you say, to this day are trying to sideline this Egyptian temple. They're, they're trying to say it wasn't founded by Ananias the high priest, but it was founded by his son. His son was a general in the, in the uh, Egyptian army. Why would he found a temple? They're trying to to make it illegitimate, to make it irrelevant. And even at the time, the top uh, Jewish, the, the, the leaders of the Jewish community in Alexandria, Philo and his brother, who uh, his brother being the financial controller of Egypt, they looked towards Jerusalem. They ignored this temple in the Delta. So there was some sensitivity both then and now. And one has to ask the question, what were they scared of? 
what was this te- this temple teaching that made them want to run away from it and what's very curious is that if you look at the Jewish experience in Egypt at the time you find there's a very very strong mystical strand running through it you've got uh, descriptions of this group called the Therapeutai who are both men and women living in retreat near Alexandria who regarded the entire Old Testament as allegory they saw them as simply stories which hid a greater truth a greater truth of this divinity underlying life and of course a prime example of this which I talk about in my book is the concept of Jacob's Ladder and the important thing of Jacob's Ladder is that this vision of the dynamic connection between this life and the other life or this world and the other world because Jacob described angels toing and froing on the ladder i.e. there was a coming and a going there's this dynamic interchange between the two it's imminent it's always there it's always available and then we had books like the Book of Enoch coming out of Egypt. And the Book of Enoch has a section describing this extraordinary mystical ascent, which is deeply personal, deeply passionate. Uh, you, you just don't get that in the Dead Sea Scrolls or in the political ideology of the Zealot movement in Judea and Galilee. And that's why I say that Jesus could not have learned his mysticism there I mean, there's that wonderful statement by Jesus and Luke where he said, When thy eye be single, thy whole body is filled with light. I mean, this is a recognition not only of the innate divinity of everybody, but of the the one underlying all existence. It's as mystical a statement as you will find in any tradition in the world. Oh, I totally agree. And when we get back to the living religion of Jesus, or the religion of the living Jesus, uh, we talk yeah. about the elements. We have earth, air, fire, and water. And then in the east, they have a fifth element. They call they call this fifth element wood, but it's also known as the quintessence, the life force energy. When we come back yeah. to these stories that Jesus is a carpenter, a woodworker, what kind right. of wood exactly are we talking about? Right. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Mr. Michael Bajan. Michael, just before the break, we were talking about this idea of Jesus as a woodworker and looking into this idea that what if he was a light worker and interested in the secrets of light? What are your thoughts on that possibility? Well, I think that's certainly what he was interested in, and I, I hadn't heard that connection of wood with uh, the ground of being or the light that you just made. I think that's very interesting because, of course, uh, the word carpenter uh, in the Bible comes from the Greek word tekton, which derives from a uh, from Platonism, really, which is uh, an architect or creator. So again, we've got a spiritual uh, a spiritual meaning which is finding expression through this kind of trade description which uh, is very interesting. But I hadn't heard about that that uh, uh, description you gave, but I, I find that perfectly plausible and certainly fits what I, I've written. Right, and so now we're developing the picture. Here's a young man, a boy, who goes to this, let's call it a secret temple in Egypt, and maybe yeah. he's learning some of these principles. Uh, I mean, I don't want to make this analogy necessarily, but it's it's almost like he's like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, learning all about the Force. And when he returns to Palestine, he is a force to be reckoned with. But w- one of the things I loved about uh, the Jesus Papers in particular is this connection that you make with the zealots. I mean, that's a key piece. Who were these people, and why does it bring such a, a different perspective to this Jesus story? Well, I... I have to sort of backtrack a bit on that. I I wrote with a colleague a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls about 15 years ago, and we did quite a study of the Zealots. Now, the the Zealots were uh, a a pretty large part of the population of Judea and Galilee who hated the Roman domination and who hated particularly the fact that the high priests had been appointed by the puppet kings, the Herodian kings, and the Herodian kings, of course, weren't of any Jewish bloodline either. So what the Zealots wanted was to get rid of the Romans and to have a high priest and a king of a pure Jewish lineage of the line of David and the line of Aaron. 
And the zealot movement started around about 6 AD with Judas of Galilee. And the key question they asked was, would you pay the taxes to Rome or not? And if you said you would pay the taxes to Rome, then they 